This is a 2019 Holden Colorado, and it seems like American car trends have finally made its way down under, as sales of these dual cab utes have exploded in the past few years, mainly as people are starting to use them as family cars or lifestyle utes. How much so? Well, the top five selling cars in Australia last year, spots one, two, and four were taken up by utes, those being the Toyota Hilux, Ford Ranger, and Mitsubishi Triton. Notice that the Colorado isn't on that list. Let's see if we can find out why. No matter which variant you get, each Colorado is powered by the same 2.8-litre Duramax turbocharged diesel engine, which pushes out 147 kilowatts of power and 500 newton meters of torque. Add that sent through either a six-speed manual or six-speed automatic gearbox in either 4x2 or 4x4 configurations. When you open the doors, the windows crack down, which is a little strange because that's usually reserved for sports sedans or coupes with their frameless doors. Inside the cabin, part of the facelift was to update the dashboard, and it draws heavily from the US spec Colorado, which isn't a bad thing, because visually I think it looks fantastic. All the buttons and knobs feel nice and tactile to use, and the design is contemporary but tough, which is great for the segment. If only they brought over the steering wheel too, this looks like something that's been ripped off a car from 15 years ago, and whilst it is leather wrapped, uh, it doesn't feel very nice to hold and it is very thin. On the left there's controls for volume, and on the right cruise control. The steering wheel also doesn't adjust for reach, only tilt. And whilst driving I noticed that the indicator stalks are too short, you really have to arch your hand over before you can use them. If you just try to hit it with the finger, it slides off. On the driver's panel, four power window switches, and all of them are one push automatic, which is good. Power door locks and power mirrors. Below, bottle holders are lined in felt, and to the driver's knee, headlight controls. In the instrument cluster, pretty standard, tack to the left and speedo on the right. There's also fuel gauge and engine temperature. And in the center, there's a small but quite useful multi-information display. It gives quite a lot of information from current speed. I'll just steady the camera. Trip computer A and B, fuel range, instant fuel consumption, there's also a timer and outside air temperature. And with the car, you can check remaining oil life, tire pressure, battery voltage, coolant temperature. And this is new. This displays how long the engine has been active and how long it has been idle for its entire life, which is something I've never seen before. Transmission fluid temperature and the tire load and speed warnings. In the center is home to the 7-inch MyLink infotainment system. You can see the graphics are a little bit bleh, but the system is responsive to the touch. There's AM and FM radio, but sadly no digital radio. Bluetooth streaming and Bluetooth phone connection. Our model also has inbuilt satellite navigation. Oh, a neat trick. If you press the up button, up comes the radio presets and they stay up on the home screen. But most importantly, Apple CarPlay and Android Auto are standard. So if you don't like this system, just push that and then you can use the associated one with your smartphone. And it works very well. There's uh, Apple Maps and Google Maps and also audio streaming. Controls for volume and tuning are nice and chunky, which makes it a breeze to use whilst driving. They're also tactile and make a satisfying click. Below, whilst it looks like it has two zone climate control, it's only single zone, so temperature on the right and fan speed on the left. One push automatic or select the zones, manual recirc and front and rear windshield defrost. Controls for the lane departure warning, traction control off, hill descent control and the parking sensors. There are two 12 volt outlets, although it'd be nice if one of them was a USB instead. Two stage seat heaters, stock standard shifter from park all the way to drive, and to the left for Tiptronic. There's a switch to go from two wheel drive, four high, and four low. Manual handbrake, two cup holders, and underneath there's a glove box, but They've installed the USB port here, a massive hump in the center, so which restricts what you can put in the center. And there's also a glove box, but it's not very big. As mentioned before, the design is fantastic, but we have to talk about build quality. This Z71 trim is the top of the range and lists for around $60,000. And just to confirm, this is a brand new car, it's only done 33 kilometers. 
Let's start with a bit of very sharp plastic behind the gear lever, which slices your finger every time you change gear, which could get annoying. And some of the switch gear feels so delicate. For instance, this center console looks like it's about to fall off. And this bit of trim here looks like it's been hand sawn from the factory. Just the materials as well and the quality of the plastics just feels very cheap. Speaking of build quality, I just noticed this. At first I thought it was something stuck to the steering wheel, but now looking at it closely, it's actually the leather. It's already peeling. Having a look at the tailgate, there's inconsistencies in the paint and the body. Look at the areas where it's bubbling and lifting on a brand new car. Usually at this time I do the Cho test, which involves a big oversized bottle and I see if it fits in any of the cup holders. But there's no need for that today because this is my normal sized water bottle. I carry it around with me everywhere. And it's the first car I've tested that not only does it not fit in the door pockets, but it doesn't fit in the center console. So uh, where do I put it whilst I'm driving? The only other place I can think of is the glove box, but that's such a pain to get to. And keep in mind, tradesmen buy these cars. So where are they going to put all their stuff? Climbing into the rear seats, space in the back of the Colorado for a dual cab ute is fantastic. I've got this seat set for my driving position. Remember, I'm six foot three or 190 centimeters. And I've still got just enough knee room, enough toe room, and just enough headroom. There are bottle holders in the doors, albeit very small. Center armrest. 12 volt power port, but there are no rear air vents. Two map pockets. Two isofix mounts, one on each side. And the center seat belt, you just have to be a bit careful when you're retracting it that you do it slowly. Because you let go from here, the clasp is gonna smash into the rear glass. And one day I can guarantee you that's going to break. The rear seat scobs can also lift up, Honda style, to review a bit more storage or the uh, tire repair kit. The seats can also be folded, but they aren't 60-40 split, it's just one piece. So you have to release it from this side, and then uh, you've got to climb over and release it from this side. Uh, you see, and then it relatches from that side. Not a very good system, you have to do it for both. And then it will go down, obviously, with the headrests. Fold it down, and they lie almost completely flat. Now, why you'd want to do this, I'm not so sure, because it's not like you can access the tray from here. It's all sealed up, so you're literally just folding down the seats. In the tray, our model includes a retractable tonneau cover, and it's released with a catch in the center. Dimensions are listed at 1484mm of length, 1122mm of width between the arches, and 1534mm of full tray width. Payload is capped at 1 tonne, and a 3.5 tonne brake towing capacity. Unlike the new Ford Ranger, there's no struts to dampen the lowering of the tailgate, or a mechanism to make it easier to lift. In an almost recurring theme, the handle for the tailgate also feels really cheap and brittle. Not sure how well it would fare in heavy-duty day-to-day usage. Holden isn't exactly known for their stellar reliability either. I've heard stories from Colorado owners uh, regarding their engine and gearbox issues, especially excessive oil consumption. Thankfully, we haven't heard too many bad stories with the post facelift model, but it's definitely something to keep in mind. Now, unfortunately, there's no driving footage as I stupidly reformatted my SD card before importing the clip, so well done me. But in terms of driving impressions, as with all Holdens, a team of Australian engineers tuned the suspension to suit our roads, and they've done a great job with the Colorado. Even with no payload at the back, the ride isn't overly bouncy or jittery over bumps. Steering is also weighted well. There's not a lot of feel in it, but it's direct enough. I just wish it adjusted for reach, so I didn't have to extend my arms so far. And the seats could use some softer padding, as they are bone hard. With 500 Nm of torque, you'd expect it to pull well, and it does. Flooring it from a start, there's definitely some turbo lag, but once it's spooled up, it does get a proper move on. Overall, I really wanted to like the new Colorado, but it feels like its beauty is only skin deep. It's disappointing as it could be a great ute, but all the small things add up to a car that I feel isn't really worth what Holden is charging. If you're dead set on one, make sure you haggle, and Holden are known to give good discounts off the MSRP. If you've enjoyed the video, as always, give us a like, and make sure you're subscribed to keep up with the latest reviews. That's all from me, and I'll see you in the next video.
It's very heavy. Oh.